It's been a confusing few days for anyone trying to follow the standoff between Russia and Ukraine. At the start of the week, Western leaders were ramping up the possibility of an imminent invasion, and a time frame was even set with multiple outlets reporting that the early hours of Wednesday morning would see the launch of a Russian invasion. This tweet from The Sun was posted on Tuesday. They accompanied the warning of a 1am invasion with breathless footage of tanks shooting missiles. It was a story apparently fed by US intelligence. But then 1am on Wednesday passed. No invasion was forthcoming. In fact, when Wednesday arrived, headlines informed us Russia had pulled back some troops from Ukraine's border. The Russian Defence Ministry claimed a number of battalions were returning to their bases after pre-planned drills. European stocks rose, fear of war subsided. But before the close of the day, US and UK intelligence pushed back against Russia's claim of a de-escalation. The West accused Russia of lying about troop withdrawals. The New York Times reported a senior American official who refused to be quoted by name told reporters that far from winding down its deployment, Moscow had added more than 7,000 combatants. The American official directly accused Russia of lying, saying there was fresh evidence it was mobilizing for war. Those briefings were then echoed by Joe Biden the following day. How high is the threat of a Russian invasion right now? It's very high. Why? It's very high because they have not they have not moved any of their troops out. They've moved more troops in. Number one. Number two, we have reason to believe that they are engaged in a false flag operation. They have an excuse to go in. Every indication we have is they're prepared to go into Ukraine, attack Ukraine, number one. Number two, I've been waiting for a response from Putin for my letter, that my response to him. It comes to that Moscow embassy. Their faction are here. Not faction, their general is here. I have not read it yet. I cannot comment on it. Have you been responded in any way? Oh, yeah. Is your sense that this is going to happen now? Yes. Not, I, my sense this will happen in the next several days. Are what are the things that Are there any what? diplomatic paths still available? Yes, the there is. There's a clear diplomatic path. That's why I asked Senator, uh, Senator Secretary Blinken to go to the United Nations and make his statement today. He'll lay out what that path is. I've laid out a path to Putin as well uh, on, I think, Sunday. And so there is a path. There is a way through this. Are you going to call Putin? Are you going to call Putin? I'm not calling Putin. I have no plans to call Putin right now. British intelligence on Russia's plans mirrored that coming from the United States. Jim Hockenhill, British chief of defence intelligence, said this week that contrary to their claims, Russia continues to build up military capabilities near Ukraine. Russia has the military mass in place to conduct an invasion of Ukraine. And the UK Ministry of Defence even tweeted an image showing the possible routes a Russian invasion could take. They suggest an invasion could include, as its first phase, a ground movement of Russian troops moving in on Kiev and battalions moving into the east of Ukraine. In phase two, Russian troops would take the rest of the country. The key comes with a caveat. It reads, warning, ground movement indicators are for illustrative purposes only. So how should we interpret all of this intelligence? If we were told an invasion would happen on Wednesday and it didn't, should we dismiss the rest as hyperbole? Well, on one level, US intelligence getting a date wrong doesn't necessarily mean the rest of what they're saying is rubbish. But even people deep within the US-UK security establishment have expressed doubts about the strength of the Western intelligence being fed to the press and public. Sir John Sawyers is a former chief of MI6. He gave an interview to Ben Judah from the Atlantic Council this week. Asked about the West's use of declassified intelligence in this current standoff, he said the following. Uh, Putin's Russia has been rather skillful at shaping narratives, <clears throat> at using uh, their arguments and, and at times their propaganda uh, in order to shape opinion, not partly in their own country, but more, uh, even more so uh, in the West. Um, and I think what uh, the US administration in particular has been quite adept at in this crisis has been, first of all, corralling the West and coordinating and orchestrating the, uh, a common Western response. And secondly, not allowing Putin to have it all his own way on the, on the airwaves. 
Now, you talk about intelligence. I think, actually, <clears throat> the, the, these are not sort of gems from, uh, from deeply sensitive uh, uh, agent reporting. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, what has been released, the, the, uh, uh, the idea that um, Putin might uh, want to dislodge Zelensky and replace him with a puppet government, uh, or that uh, he's going to contrive uh, uh, a pretext uh, for a Russian intervention in the uh, in the east of Ukraine, um, these are based on a on a growing understanding and analysis of Putin rather than deep uh, secret intelligence reports. And I think wrapping them up as intelligence and adding a few sort of juicy names uh, to the reporting just gives uh, uh, it just gives a uh, uh, some some good stories from the media and helps push back against the narrative. It's a skillful use. Of um, of information and analysis to um, uh, to uh, uh, turn the tables on Putin and his own ability to uh, to to uh, dominate the airwaves. Later in the interview, Ben Judah asked a question which made the significance of all this even more explicit. It would seem as if the uh, Western governments might have exaggerated a bit the prospect of a full blooded invasion of Ukraine. Well, what I do think is that um, it was easier. Uh, for Western governments to bring uh, uh, together their agreed response and to stand up to Putin in the face of that sort of threat. Um, uh, and as President Biden perhaps rather infelicitously uh, described, uh, you know, he got into trouble when he started speculating about what would happen if there was a minor cursion into Ukraine in one of his earlier broadcasts on this. I think that is more difficult, um, uh, uh, but it's also the more likely scenario that a combination of, of cyber, of, uh, of limited intrusion, uh, of, um, uh, uh, of political steps uh, associated with, uh, with the military, um, uh, military manoeuvres, uh, uh, as he did in 2014 in Ukraine and as he did in 2008 in, in Georgia, is probably a more likely scenario. I think if he'd gone all the way to Kiev, and you know, he could still, he could prove me wrong tomorrow. Um, I don't know what's going through Putin's head, but, uh, uh, but watching him over the last 20 years or so, I think it's not really in character for him to invade and occupy a whole country um, uh, 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 and and uh, think that that is going to be a success. The, they had their own experience in Afghanistan, as we we have had uh, since then. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, 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 he has watched very closely what the fate of um, of the Americans and the coalition in, in Iraq was. It's quite easy to drive to Baghdad and overthrow the government. It's a whole lot harder to hold the country together over the next 10 or 20 years. So according to that former intelligence chief, yes, what was in fact analysis might have been dressed up as intelligence. And yes, the risks might have been exaggerated, but that was to build a broader coalition. If we just said, or if the, if the West just said, if America just said there might be a minor incursion in Ukraine, it would have been harder to unite the West. Now, I find this a little bit worrying because we've we've seen how intelligence was used to build a coalition before WMDs in Iraq. Um, not that you know this is necessarily a repeat of that. It's potentially more complex. Aaron, I want to bring you in on this. I mean, what do you make of the breathless coverage we've seen of of Ukraine Russia over the past week, and uh, and what did you make of those comments from the former MI6 chief? It's been really quick moving. So I mean, it's. You would be very uh, unwise, I think, to sort of make a pronouncement today and uh, think it's going to last longer than, say, 72 hours. I think, you know, it's still a very dynamic situation, events unfolding from, from, from effectively day to day. Even, you know, in the last few hours, there's been an explosion in, I think, Donetsk, uh, which is causing a great deal of discussion. And, and, and in terms of what that might catalyze going forward, was it a false flag and so on? Talking about that video, Michael, I mean, wow, that was really, really, really insightful. And I was very surprised that a former head of MI6, Britain's spy agency, would so openly talk about the reason behind what was going on here. This was an information war. This was effectively a propaganda effort by the British government, various Western allies with their media to effectively mislead domestic audiences. Now, the argument would be, which he says there, in some ways over, some ways less so, Putin does this, so we have to do it too. Uh, we are misleading people in order to avert a, a material military escalation between Russia and Ukraine, and potentially that may involve at some point Western allies as well. So we certainly don't want to do that. This is by far the better of two evils. I mean, that's one logic, but still, it is deeply worrying for me, Michael, that 
a former head of the security services, can so openly talk about the instrumentalization of the media to advance the interests of the state. You know, the media is meant to be independent of the political power of the state and its various agencies in order to hold it accountable. So this to me is really worrying. And the way he's talking about the media is really not that different to how you see in authoritarian regimes. Now, I'm not saying we live in an authoritarian regime. Um, and, and by the way, the reporting of, you know, the US and the UK going into Iraq, Afghanistan 20 years ago wasn't particularly good either. It's not like things have really deteriorated in that, in that respect. But to be talking about it so overtly in public really struck me, really struck me. And I was surprised, you know, until the 1990s, I think, I don't know the specifics here, but MI6 didn't even really admit it existed, you know? Um, well, it's not even called MI6 now, you know, the, I think it's called SIS or something. Goodness knows. But it's the external uh, spy agency for the United Kingdom. And now you have somebody, you know, what, what next, Michael? Is he going to go on TikTok? Say, uh, you know, talking about how the UK helps overthrow... Uh, regimes it doesn't like overseas. So yes, the public nature of it was very surprising and very insightful. It is, it is very odd if you're fighting an information war to then give a live commentary of it. It feels like it you know, potentially undermines the point. I feel like you know, the, the first rule of information warfare should probably be don't talk about information warfare. But you know, maybe the fact that they're talking about it, that is a, you know, maybe, maybe that suggests how inherently transparent um, they, they want to be. Um, I, want, I want to stick with this issue of intelligence briefings. I've got another clip for you because we've, we've shown you the former MI6 chief. On Radio 4 this morning, Nick Robinson interviewed a former chief of the US Army. Michael Mullen was chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff between 2007 and 2011. That level of detail uh, released publicly and put on the front page of every uh, uh, media outlet uh, in the world uh, is a much different tactic. And it's a tactic designed to let the world know uh, and let Putin know uh, we all know what's going on. Whether that'll have a deterrent impact uh, is still out there. You know, the war hasn't started. Hopefully it won't. There is a risk, though, isn't there, after the failed intelligence about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, that it allows Putin to claim that it's all false, that it's all made up, that the West's intelligence can't be trusted. The intelligence back then uh, really was used to start a war. The intelligence that's being released now is attempting to do the exact opposite, to make sure a war, a very devastating war, costly war, uh, will not start. So the difference between the intelligence we shared around Iraq and the intelligence shared around Ukraine isn't that the old intelligence was false and we've now learned our lesson, but rather back then we were using flimsy intelligence to start a war and now we're using flimsy intelligence to stop one. Not particularly reassuring. And whatever the motive, this slapdash approach is making a lot of people look quite silly. Melinda Haring is Deputy Director of the Atlantic Council, one of the most prestigious and well-funded pro-NATO think tanks. Last Friday, she tweeted, Putin has big weekend plans in Ukraine. One, he's going to cut power and heat, knock out Ukrainian Navy and Air Force, kill general staff and hit them with cyber attack. Two, then install pro-Russian president and free resort to full-scale military invasion if Ukraine doesn't give in. Seven days have now passed and none of those things have happened. And it's not just critics of US foreign policy that are getting frustrated with this gung-ho approach. David Arakamia is the head of President Zelensky's Servant of the People Party. He said this this week. I think when this phase disappears in two or three weeks, we should do a retrospective analysis of how large, very well-known media began to disseminate information worse than Skabiva and Solovyov, two Russian state propagandists. Frank Fakes in CNN, Bloomberg, The Wall Street Journal, we must study this because these are elements of a hybrid war. The hysteria is now costing the country two to three billion dollars every month. We can't borrow in foreign markets because the rates there are crazy. Many exporters refuse. Every day we count the losses of the economy and then distribute this information to our partners through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because they must understand when someone decides to move the embassy to Lviv, they must understand that such news will cost the Ukrainian economy several hundred million dollars. Of course, while the Ukrainians may be critical of hysteria in the West, they are even more concerned by the disinformation campaign coming from 
Russia, their foreign secretary today, tweeted, We categorically refute Russian disinformation reports on Ukraine's alleged offensive operations or acts of sabotage in chemical production facilities. Ukraine does not conduct or plan any such actions in the Donbass. We are fully committed to diplomatic conflict resolution only. Russia's disinformation, of course, goes beyond claims about sabotaging production facilities. This week, Putin went so far as to accuse the Ukrainians of genocide in the Donbass. And that's a claim that echoes commentary being broadcast across Russian media. Margarita Simonyan is head of the state-funded broadcaster RT. She recently said on a talk show on the Russia One channel, it's a war between the Ukrainian government and its own people. People are dying there every day. Thousands of civilians died there. Thousands of children lost their limbs there, buried in little coffins. Go there once, you'll change your attitude completely, and you'll understand that Russia can't help but stop this war. Do we have to wait until they organize concentration camps out there, until they start poisoning their people with gas? This is, of course, nonsense, and it appears to be a clear attempt to drum up support in Russia if Putin does decide to invade Ukraine. And there has been an escalation on this front today. Max Seddon is Moscow bureau chief at the Financial Times. He tweeted, separatists in East Ukraine have announced they're evacuating the entire civilian population to Russia, citing increased shelling on the front lines. Pushilin claims Zelensky will give Ukraine's army the order to attack, sounding more and more like a potential Russian casus belli. So Pushilin there being uh, a leader of, of one of the separatists in eastern Ukraine. The default should be, Michael, that you're just very sceptical of any single news source. That should be the default. And when you see in legacy media talk of intelligence sources, OK, well, what's the intelligence source? Is it signals intelligence? Is it literally the interception of information within, say, you know, the Russian military establishment? That's a big deal, right? If you intercept signals intelligence, that's a massive deal. Is it human intelligence? You know, the arguments for going to war in Iraq were based on human intelligence. Now, of course, people can want to peddle their own agendas around the reality. In Iraq, it was about WMD. Multiple, multiple people lied. In one instance, that was to basically get citizenship in Germany. Um, there was a former nuclear scientist basically lied his pants off in order to integrate himself with people who really exercised a great deal of control over him. Uh, it could be domestic political interests trying to, you know, fight their corner. And they think that regime change suits them, as was the case for certain people in Iraq. So hu human intelligence is always very dodgy. What we're seeing here, though, Michael, is when when you hear in the, in the media, and legacy media, intelligence, often it doesn't seem to relate to two of these, either of these rather. So you go back to the original video recording we saw of the Atlantic Council. By the way, the Atlantic Council, who's on their advisory um, advisory committee? It's the son-in-law of uh, Lenny Kuchma, a guy called Pinchuk, who is a, a, a domestic oligarch who has massive interest in the media. So again, if you're talking about a, a non-governmental organization which has an impartial overview of what's going on in the Ukraine, I would suggest it shouldn't be somebody whose own advisory council includes a Ukrainian national who's married to the daughter of a former president of Ukraine. Again, just my, my personal opinion. You know, incidentally, Kuchma was involved in the Minsk II process. So actually, the Atlantic Council would be on the other side. But regardless, these aren't impartial actors necessarily. I mean, my God, Ukraine is just a, it's a crazy, crazy country with regards to oligarchical factions moving from one side to the other, which really makes a, a, a sort of, you know, it's derisory, the idea there's some good guys and bad guys in terms of the country's elite, because they swap sides, you know, so frequently, it's hard to keep up. Um, so skepticism is very useful. And like I say, that thing about intelligence, is it signals intelligence? Okay, then take that seriously. Is it human intelligence? Well, who are the sources? Do they have an agenda of their own? And if it's neither of those two, if it's just analysis, as John Sawyer said uh, to, to Ben Judah, then you should just dismiss it out of hand. And the best, the best approach, and you'll hear this, I think, frequently with people on YouTube, you know, you'd hear it from Russell Brand or, or, or somebody on the radical right or... Glenn Greenwald or you and me or an ultra leftist, the best approach generally with these things is to have a range of news sources. So I always say to people, you know, read The Economist, read The Times, read the FT, you know, get the newsletters, read stuff from the Telegraph. I mean, it's a hell of a lot of work, right? Maybe narrow it down. Read Navarra Media, look at domestic uh, media content coming out of these countries. Finally, the big problem in getting good information when it comes to 
Russia and what it views as its sphere of influence or China and its sphere of influence is that we have very few journalists in this country who either speak Russian or Chinese. We certainly don't, Michael. You have a few very good Russian speakers at the BBC, but other than that, not really. And so actually journalists capable of doing that skeptical, hard, nuanced work, engaging with the primary sources, very difficult, very rarely exists. So what we're left with instead is pundits, often with a vested interest in a certain outcome, uh, or, or even just not taking, you know, it's the sources they're receiving skeptically. That's not good enough if you want to be informed. Mm. I mean, I suppose I'd, I'd add a couple of things, which is, because obviously, you know, what, what people might say to us who are, you know, less critical of of, of the American or, or UK defense establishments or NATO, for example, they'd say you're playing into Putin's hands because precisely what he wants isn't so much um, people in the West to say, oh, Putin is great. It's for people in the West to throw their hands up and say, well, I've got no idea what's going on. So I'm going to be completely you know, nihilistic about this. Who knows the truth? So I'm going to sort of abstain from even taking any judgment. Now, I do think there, there could be something to that. And so I would say, don't just distrust everything. <laughs> Obviously, you have to have a skeptical attitude to, to all of these things we're hearing, especially when it comes from, you know, any government intelligence agency, because as you've seen, both from that former MI6 chief and that former chief of, of the US defense staff, they're quite openly using these briefings as a, a method of warfare. Now, that could be justified. You could say, look, if, if by talking about a false flag operation, you make a false flag less likely, that's potentially justifiable from a, you know, a strategic point of view. But at the same time, you have to you know, be aware that that's probably what's going on, right? So, so you are being played in a way, whether it's justified for them to play you is a, is a slightly separate question. I'd say the easiest way to get grounding in sort of foreign policy questions is basically to ground yourself in recent history, because who is where right now in Eastern Ukraine, who's firing what missile, I think it's going to be, however long I spend on the internet this evening, it's going to be very difficult for me to work it out. Working out what are the different grievances on each, on each side, what deals were made, why Russia is annoyed about the, the expansion of NATO, why the Ukrainians might want to be part of a Western alliance. All of these things we do have a much deeper understanding of because they're, they're not just reliant on he said, she said. So I do think that grounding in recent history, which is actually something that I think the mainstream media is, is is terrible at getting across because all they you know they always start the story wherever it makes the other guys look bad. So they start the story. Twenty fourteen, Putin didn't like um, the the pro Western government in Ukraine, so he started invading. He took Crimea and he made sure the country would be collapsed for the next eight years or however long it's been. What that ignores is that before that, you had a situation where the EU said to Ukraine, look, you can't have relations both with the EU and Russia economically. You're going to have to choose. They put them in a very difficult situation. They also didn't give the, the Ukrainian president a particularly good deal. So they turned to Russia. That prompted uh, an uprising and what can reasonably be called a coup, even though Again, you could say that was justified because the president at the time had, had shot on protesters. All I'm here to say, I'm not going to give you a short history of Ukraine because it is incredibly complicated, but it is grounding, grounding your understanding, grounding your knowledge in recent history that I think really helps with that. I do actually recommend on this front, Adam Tooze has a great blog where he goes into sort of the, the past 10 years in Ukraine, which is much less biased and sort of... Um, simplistic in a sort of manic and there's good guys and bad guys than you will see, you know, even on the BBC, you know, and especially obviously in, in the Times and, and from the government. The whole manic and good guys, bad guys, that rarely exists in life. It certainly doesn't exist in post-Soviet states and their politics, like really more than anywhere else. So uh, yeah, it's, it's the piety and the self-righteousness and the surety that people have with their kind of takes can be very, very grating. And it is just remarkable how little you can learn from the media. You know, if you want to be uninformed about things like Russia, Ukraine, like you say, watch the BBC, go on the Guardian website, read the Times. Like I say, you want to read a, a wide range of sources. If you're time limited, you're wasting your time there. It's it, it's like, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to make sense of anything, really. Like you say, Maidan in 2014, that was it was a coup. There, there, there clearly were people getting involved in that, leveraging it in certain ways to maximize their interests. Now, like you say, it's also legitimate because you had protesters being fired on by the government. So it's very complicated. But when we talk about, you know, the, the, the various 
oligarchs which go from one side to the other. A lot of these sort of post-Soviet, you know, freedom fighters who were on the same side as the color revolutions, a great deal of them, not just in Ukraine, but many other countries too, were actually the key guys in the Soviet apparatus before the fall of the Berlin Wall and before 1990, and it all changed. You know, these were party men. So it is very, very complicated at the best of times. And what I would say to our audience is, of course, inform yourself. Adam Tooze is always a good place to start, for, you know, virtually anything, Michael. But also that the Russophobia and the Sinophobia, I think, is just really deeply unhelpful. And I think it also helps. One more thing. Try and put your, 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 yourself in the shoes of somebody who's in receipt of state media in Russia or China and, and try and think how they think. You know, Russia has been invaded in the last 200 years, three times. You've got Napoleon, you've got after the revolution in 1920, and of course you have by the Third Reich after 1940-41. And so within the Russian psyche, there is actually a perfectly understandable and I think legitimate fear of invasion by very powerful countries. And so that can be leveraged by a domestic political elite to say, look, we have to get involved in Ukraine because we, we're going to have NATO and we're going to have US soldiers on our doorstep in a country which we historically view as part of Russian civilization. You don't have to agree with that or, or not. But my point is, that's what many, many people themselves believe in Russia. So read Adam Tooze, be skeptical, and also, yeah, don't do the whole bigotry othering of Russians or Chinese or Iranians or whoever it is the BBC doesn't like this week. 